and so we so no one better place to introduce the discussion to today and this book talk about the early steps of European integration where it was maybe already about governance but not yet about a single market much more about technology and Gabi the introduction of the discussion is yours Thanks a lot. Thank you very much Frank, for the nice introduction and uh, welcome everybody to this uh, first of its kind ebook talk. So um, technological transformation hits us uh, as it hits everyone at the moment and um, that perfectly links to the book of uh, two professors that we are talking about today and it couldn't have been uh, a better selection and a better choice to introduce the um, the online version of our book talks than uh, the book, this wonderful book. And it's a pity that you you might have it in front of you because it has wonderful pictures and everything. This wonderful book, um, Writing the Rules for Europe, Experts, Cartels and International Organizations by Ioan Schott and uh, Wolfram Kaiser. Professor Schott is a uh, professor of comparative global history at Utrecht University and he's director of the Transformative Innovation Policy Consortium. Previously, before he went to Utrecht, he was at Sussex University Business School where he directed the Science Policy Research Unit. Um, Johan's focus is largely on long-term transformation, the historical analysis, for example, of policy paradigms that are very important, like the sustainable development paradigms and long-term transformation, transformation history of Europe. Wolfram Kaiser is known to you as uh, a non-resident visiting follower to EPRS as well. He's Professor of European Studies at the University of, of Portsmouth, visiting professor of the College of Europe and a senior research fellow at the Center of Global Cooperative Research in Duisburg. Um, his focus is on narratives of European integration, history of globalization, and on EU institutions. In 2018, he has published a book, a recent study on the European Parliament and uh, on its role in, in institutional reforms. Um, where do we stand with the book? We are all very much involved in discussions about big data, e-governance, um, 3D printing, blockchain, all the technological transformations of which we know that um, they play an increasingly important role in our political system, in the political system of the EU, and that they will have a transformative impact on how we govern ourselves and govern the European Union. And it is exactly here where the book starts informing our ideas and our reflection on how to institutionalize these transformative impact. The book presents a new perspective on the 21st century um, and it extends that with in, in, in a long perspective. So it says it's a long century. It doesn't start as previously um, focused on by historians in 1914 and it extends to the end of the Cold War. We say it's a long, the book says it's a long century. It starts 1850 and ends in 2000. It focuses on the technology, on the, on, the, on the impact of technology, um, on the transformation and creation of Europe and very much focuses on the international technology, technocracy impact on um, the relations between states, but also impacts on politics, the economy and the society. So pretty much analyzing something that we need to transform into politics. Um, the book not touches only about on the material dimension of technology, but also the ideational and the institutional part. And it's embedded in, in uh, a long-term uh, uh, project and uh, into a book series that groups and, and presents us with a, the results of a broader research um, on technology and transformation in Europe um, that uh, Johan is one of the co-editors of. And here I would actually like to start, Johan, can you tell us a bit about the embedment of this series and about the broader idea in which we can put the book? Um, as a publication? Sure. Um, can I have my slides on? Visuals? In the meantime, I will start. Uh, the book series consists of six books. Um, and in this book series, we uh, with all the uh, authors, 
uh, this is the second slide, the first slide, please. Uh, we had a discussion on how to conceptualize Europe. So what is Europe? And we decided to go for an actor definition. So what we do in the book series, we follow actors, how they are perceiving and constructing Europe and how they define Europe. And we look at many actors. So here you see the six volumes. Uh, for example, the first volume was about consumers and users, how they were constructing Europe. Uh, for example, you have to think about uh, fashion. So many consumers were involved in building a fashion culture, uh, bicycling, uh, waste management. Uh, so, but we also uh, look at governments, companies, experts and scientists. So you could say we look at how Europe was built from the bottom up through a whole set of new international networks and connections. And of course, these activities led to outcomes. So they led to European experiences, European standards, European networks, European infrastructures, European <laughs> consumption patterns. Uh, and they are in a way all tentative and each of them may have a difficult, different spatial reach. So you could say that this leads many Europe's. And this is also one of the conclusions of the entire series. There are many Europe's and the European integration process, the kind of proper process which started after the Second World War was embedded in a much larger European integration process with many actors involved. And this larger process started deep in the 19th century. It did not start with building democracy in Greece, as sometimes is said about the origin of the European integration, for example. We think the origin are clearly come with the emergence of a whole set of new attempts in the second half of the 19th century to build European standards and so on. Uh, we focus on technology. Why technology? Well, technology is often neglected in history. There are many history books about the history of the 20th century that don't mention the automobile or don't mention even the internet uh, well, uh, or the computer. And uh, I'm an historian of technology and we look at how technology has shaped history and we often felt it's, it's left out. So the book series is a correction. It brings back the role of uh, history. Um, this is also important because uh, uh, it had a lot of impact and we used the notion of hidden integration of Europe uh, to, to, uh, to talk about this process. It's hidden from the view of our historical understanding, so hidden because a lot of the actors we study didn't want to go into the public realm. They worked in the corridors. Uh, they developed their ideas uh, outside the view of the public press. Uh, so it was a kind of hidden process and it has technocratic tendencies, which we will talk about later. Uh, as I said, it consists of six volumes. One is about consumers. The second one was about the role of experts in building up big European projects, or such as space pro projects, nuclear project, but also European universities. Uh, then the third volume is our volume. It talks more about European integration process itself and the international organizations that emerged in the 19th century. Wolfram will talk more about our book. And then we have a book about infrastructures, so railways, communication, energy, uh, infrastructures, but also uh, uh, natural uh, uh, infrastructure, so landscapes. Uh, there's a separate book about communication, uh, communicating Europe through uh, radio, television, telegraphy, uh, the internet. And then we have a book which puts Europe in a global context because we, if you follow how actors were building Europe, Europe was often built in the colonies and also in other parts of the world. So we look at how Europe was constructed through a detour, a global detour. We have a separate volume on that. Uh, 
Can I have the next slide, please? Well, um, we also have built a digital museum. So each book has been translated in an exhibition together with 10 science museums across Europe. And there is a learning platform behind this and already 20,000 students have used this. At the moment, this is not very active anymore, I must admit, because of uh, lack of funding. That brings me to another point. This was, has, was a big project which involved 250 scholars all over Europe. Uh, so we brought together many research projects uh, into one big platform, uh, which was run for uh, 15 years. And the book series itself was written by 13 authors in a five year intense process. Can I have the next slide, please? Well, this is one example, one of the pictures. The books are richly illustrated and you can read the books on the level of the pictures and the captions. So we have done, we have spent a lot of time on, on the editing of this. Uh, this is a picture of international railways created after the second, uh, in the early 60s by Eastern European railway experts. And this is how they saw Europe. So they saw a set of standards in, you could, we should say, Western, Southern and Northern Europe. Then there were Soviet standards and there was a buffer zone in which both standards would apply. So this was their attempt to become a part of a European zone as a very important place where both standards apply. And this is also one of the qualities of Europe because Europe in the end is often about how to interface because there's so many distinct standards and differences and this ability to interface is a core quality of, of Europe. Well, now Wolfram can take over. Can we have the next slide about our book? And Wolfram will start introducing the book. Wolfram, are you still there? Yes, okay, I'm sorry. Perfect. So no. I'm now going, thank you, Johan. I'm now going to talk about our book, which Johan and I uh, have written together, Writing the Rules for Europe, Experts, Cartels, and International Organizations. And what you see here is the image that we chose for the cover of the book, which uh, shows the inauguration or celebration of the inauguration of the European Coal and Steel Community of the six founding member states in 1951-52. Uh, and this is the uh, day of the creation of the customs union and market for coal and steel and it shows a locomotive and obviously on rails and the flags of the six founding member states so it combines two sectors and technologies and sectors that we particularly look at in the book which is railways and also uh, this in, uh, steel sector secondly now, uh, when we came together, Johan was already a part of this or had created this larger project and network of technological history. His background is mainly, as is already said, in the history of technology as well as in future oriented innovation studies. So when we came together, his interest was mainly in economic, political and social context and impact of technologies. And he was also interested in the long term perspective on Europe and European integration. Uh, whereas my own um, background is mainly in the history of European integration and processes of globalization, and I was mainly frustrated with it's the history of European integrations, very often narrowly institutional focus, technical teleological character and lack of long term perspective. So we came from different backgrounds and that was a general principle that applied to all of the books in the series that they try to integrate these different backgrounds of the different authors. And this obviously involved quite a long research and writing process about which I want to talk a little bit before moving on to some of the key findings of our book. Now, in terms of the research process, first of all, of course, we had to sit down to define guiding questions, to come up with a book structure and also to define what uh, additional research we would have to do for the book. And there was quite a lot of that. Then uh, the whole process had to be integrated, including writing up the manuscript. But we decided to do that in such a way that because we used two different sectors or technologies that each of us would be responsible for one of those. So Johan took the lead on uh, 
railways and I took the lead on steel and we each mainly wrote the two chapters each that cover each of these two technologies. We selected these two as two different types of industries, transport as an infrastructural industry and railways especially being significant for transnational connections since roughly the middle of the 19th century and steel the production of components for infrastructure, for machinery, for building industry. So obviously also a key industry of the first industrial revolution. And this also allowed us to take a long-term perspective that would actually cover the period from the middle of the 19th century up to around 2000. Um, both sectors we also found after some preliminary research were really uh, promising in the sense that they were interesting for transnational cooperation mechanisms and also working practices. And both obviously were crucially important also to post-1945 reconstruction, the post-1945 reconstruction of Europe. Now, what were the challenges in this collaborative process of research and writing? There were several. I will just briefly talk about three. The first one was how to create a pan-European perspective and to consider the multiple peripheries of Europe equally uh, together with centers of integration. One of the big problems with the history of the European Union, starting with the history of the European Coal and Steel community, is that it always writes history from the center outwards through the different enlargement processes, etc. And we were keen with the long-term perspective that we wanted to take to, cover, to develop this pan-European perspective and to also look at different uh, peripheries. We had to work for this with some research assistance because neither Johan nor I have a reading knowledge in Slavic languages. So we worked with some of these people from the larger network, as Johan has already referred to, to utilize Central European and Soviet sources for selected stories, for example, about railway wagons after 1945 or research collaboration in the Comic Con, uh, whereas we were able to cover um, sources in other. Western and Southern European languages ourselves. Secondly, uh, how to cover multiple transnational and international organizations, because we wanted to decenter what is now the European Union in this long term perspective. It was obvious that we would have to look at the roles of other organizations since uh, the 19th century. Some of this has been addressed recently in literature, particularly on the League of Nations, about which quite a lot of research has been done in the last 15 years or so. But we needed to do quite a lot of additional research. Uh, in addition to the League archives in Geneva, we also looked, for example, at the archives of the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe after 1945, the OECD, and several others. The problem that we faced in the process was that the sources of transnational voluntary organizations run by businesses and business groups, especially from the 19th century, couldn't often couldn't be located or have obviously been lost through the two world wars. And of course, there's no legal obligation for these types of organizations to keep their records. So this was a particular challenge and perhaps also a little bit of a void in the way in which we had, had to write the book. And then the third challenge was writing the whole thing up together. So obviously we had different writing styles. We're both not native speakers of English. Uh, there were some differences in interpretation or perhaps regarding our normative conclusions from the historical analysis. Uh, but this writing up process was heavily supported by a joint stay, which we had together as a group of authors at the Netherlands Institute for Advanced Studies for five months and also regular meetings between you and myself with intensive discussion. Now, what are the key findings of the book? I would like to highlight four of these key findings. The first is, I've alluded to that already, the need to decenter the European Union or what is now the European Union for understanding its own origins and trajectories in the post-war period. Monet developed this wonderful narrative after 1945 or after the creation of the European Coal and Steel Community about uh, it being so unique as a new, what he then called, for the first time, supranational organization. Uh, and that was a narrative that purposefully, for political purposes, ignored multiple origins and trajectories of what could be called core Europe integration after 1945. So what we found is that there were several deeply entrenched paths that uh, go back to the 19th century, which have co-shaped European integration, and especially what we call, Johan has mentioned the term already, technocratic internationalism. Technocratic internationalism as a strategy to create space for the transnational politics of expertise. 
despite depoliticizing issues that were apparently, then apparently only technical, sidelining in the process national forum and other ministries and directly democratically legitimized national governments and parliaments, which these experts often thought would only politicize uh, technical issues and that that would lead then to uh, national conflict and possibly had led also to or contributed significantly to world war. Second uh, conclusion in our book is the need to understand the operation of trans transnational spaces of politics and policy making as populated by often cooperating, but very often also competing transnational voluntary and international organizations. There are multiple examples of this in our book, and I'll just give you two from the railways chapters, which Johan wrote. One is the attempt politically motivated, obviously in the context of the end of the First World War, by the French governments after 1918-19 to topple what they saw a German-dominated existing organization of railways and transnational railway coordination, which led to institutional duplication and uh, to problems with this duplication, and in the end to continued cooperation, quite close cooperation at the level of experts who had often known each other from the pre-war period and thus to forms of accommodation between the different existing organizations. And a second example concerns the multiple actors that were involved in post-war reconstruction of the railway system in Europe, including the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe. Their competences and activism helps explain what has, is often portrayed in the literature about the EU as the failure of EEC transport policy from the 1960s onwards. The main reason for that really was that the EEC space did not align with rail transport spaces, which included crucial connecting spaces like Switzerland, for example, and also had obvious continuing transnational pan-European dimensions, even in times of the Cold War. And uh, therefore, the existing organizations and patterns of cooperation prevailed for a very long time until the European Union more or less nearly covered the whole of Europe at least the, those parts of Europe that were crucial for the transnational organization of railways. A third uh, main conclusion is that collective practices in these technology-driven sectors very often persisted across institutional changes. And here I would like to draw your attention to the, sec the steel sector as an example, where um, patterns of practices that were basically developed in the late 19th century and in the interwar period and in the international steel cartels prevailed and persisted well into the European coal and steel community. The European coal and steel community at the formal legal level had a strong anti-cartel thrust, but below that level business influence continued to prevail, which was very heavily informed by the previous cartel cooperation from the interwar period, so that the ECSE in the ECSE businesses continued to practice cartels in the export field, export cartels, and even in the middle of the 1960s, temporarily um, created or recreated a domestic cartel, which was obviously illegal under the ECSE, but the high authority didn't actually do anything about it for political reasons. Now, the fourth um, main finding that I would like to mention to conclude is the need to understand the expansion and enlargement of the present-day European Union as a real, real struggle to become the main game in town. It wasn't clear in the 1950s that the EEC or the ECS, the EEC and Eurotin would necessarily become so hegemonic by the year 2020. And this process of becoming more hegemonic was greatly facilitated really only by the formation of the internal market from the single European Act onwards and by the acquisition of the European Communities and European Union of regulatory competences and also by the greater global regulatory competition which in turn seemed to require Europe to speak with one, uh, one voice rather than fragmented uh, into different existing organizational patterns that cover different spaces, etc. Now, our main objective with the book is not to advise on the EU's future, rather to bring out the difficulty to reconcile different objectives for European integration and trajectories of governance practices inside what is now the European Union, 
However, Johan will now nevertheless draw some draw out some conclusions from his perspective about the future of the EU. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Wolfram. Um, I will be very brief for the sake of time. Just mention three issues that could be uh, discussed. Our book shows that the European integration process and in the end the EU is built on what we call a technocratic internationalist tradition. And this has heavily influenced the institutional design of the EU uh, and has led to the democratic deficit because there's a very strong technocratic origin which still lingers on, so to say, as a le strong legacy. And I feel that all of the new issues that the EU tries to deal with, like climate change, migration, inequality, need a strong democracy component, while its institutional design has a strong technocratic component. So this gap is, is really worrying. And the question is how to overcome it. Well, that's my second point. A more radical solution could be to say, okay, the current integration process, we keep as it is in a way, we accept that it has technocratic tendencies because after all, we need experts and we need, so I'm not, never have been in the business of saying technocracy is, is, is wrong. The question is how do you build the, the boundary between technocracy and democracy? And how do you negotiate this boundary? Uh, so the second point is perhaps we should start a new political process for unification because the, the whole idea that you can go through small incremental steps as was done in the Schumann declaration, you know, go from technical to the political is perhaps a complete wrong idea. Uh, and I think you can see this with the Euro where we have a technocratic, technocratic implementation of the euro but not a political unification process necessary to manage the process uh, a last point is that the problem for the eu is of course the lack of um, uh, belonging sense of belonging to the eu of the population and uh, i think in the 19th century and uh, there was a process of building up this sense of belonging through all the organizations we have studied and all the practices. But since the EU became very hegemonic, they have called themselves Europe. So in all the EU pro promotion, they say we represent Europe. So this uh, deletes the space for citizens to be pro-Europe, but have difficulties with the EU. And I think it's in the interest of the EU to leave that space wide open for people to develop this sense of belonging to Europe and still being able to ve be very critical about the EU. And that space is lost. And I think that's a problem. That was my contribution. Thank you very much, Johan. Um, and, and a great bump at the end. <laughs> we will come back to that because this link in between democracy and technology, uh, technology is something that I'm, 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 I'm democracy, technocracy and technology is something that I wanted to come back to um, later. Um, the, the question would go to both, but maybe Wolfram can start answering. And I think we can stop sharing the slides now. Is that true, Johan? Yes. Yeah, super. Um, so technology, the, the way you framed it and the way you analyzed um, the impact of technology in the book um, seems to point at as technology as a subject and as an enabler. So as a subject of regulation on the one hand, but also as an enabler for um, transnational governance in itself. Um, could you elaborate a bit if there is a difference that you found in your research on the one hand as technology as a subject of regulation within Europe and technology as an enabler for cooperation um, in Europe. Wolfram, could you start maybe? Or Johan, depending on who wants to join first. Well, I think uh, Wolfram is, is, is muted. So uh, you need to unmute yourself, Wolfram, if you want yes, to speak. Okay, sorry, I was just suggesting whether you could start. Okay, uh, I think both are connected. 
because what happened in the 19th century, we, we got a, a whole set of new technologies, telegraphy and railway, and they had to cross borders. And for them to cross borders, they had to be regulated. And at first, this was a task for foreign uh, policy, which was just, you know, developing and emerging. But then uh, it, the diplomats couldn't deal with technology. So they delegated the task to experts. And then the experts said, we don't need the diplomats. So, you know, we, we, can, we can work within our own context and our own organizations. So what you see is the development of these technologies, which led to the question, how can they cross borders, which led to a lot of governance structures. And it also led to a specific way of managing international relations, which you call technocratic internationalism. Eh? So actors wanted to keep the, the, the politics out and focus on the technical, but still work towards European integration through technical means. And this, of course, became later labeled as the functional approach in political science. Uh, but the actors were, were building Europe in this way. Perhaps just like to add one point in our book, we don't actually take for granted what these actors of technocratic internationalism claim, which is that it's only about technical issues. The technical issues also for the technical experts are political, but in a different sense from the sense of the controversies or conflicts among diplomats or national ministries, namely in the sense that they are trying to use this argument about the technical in order to create space for themselves and in order to exclude, in inverted commas, politics or politically directly legitimized actors in uh, ministries or diplomats, for example, from these policymaking processes, because they are convinced that they can find better solutions that work, you know, in the, in the words of money, that are in the interest of all and that they can find solutions that are technically optimal. But of course, this is also a political strategy in order to create, to create space for themselves. And this is something that we look at in some detail in terms of how this played out empirically in these two different sectors. When, when you say in your book that these um, practices to find new technical solutions and to find solutions for technology and technology policy um, were resilient to ruptures, so these links, these expertise, these structures survived ruptures within Europe. Was that always positive? Or did you also find negative elements of this path dependence of expertise within rulemaking? Uh, well, that depends on your normative perspective. It certainly led to um, a lack of integration sometimes as in the example that I've already mentioned between the formal integration and the legal rules and institutional setup on the one hand and the actual practices on the other. I think that's become very clear in the literature about the formation of uh, core Europe in the European coal and steel community, which had, as I've said already, which had these formal rules, which were quite strongly informed also by Amer the American antitrust uh, tradition and policies and more informal advice rather than uh, direct pressure exercised by the US government in the early 1950s during the negotiations about the coal and steel community. But when it was set up, and this was something that certainly Monet also uh, supported very much, but when the organization was set up, businesses, business groups through the consultative committee, for example, or by working together closely with the national ministries, et cetera, managed to some extent to take control of the institution or take back control of the institution and the way in which they then actually work was still in the way of very close a cooperation among transnationally among the businesses and other historians have found that these business links even persisted and were quite unharmed to a surprising degree by the second world war uh, even for example between french and german uh, steel uh, producers and, and in family owned businesses so they actually managed to implant the traditional cartel part practices into the completely new and different institutional structure so you then have a clash between the legal objectives uh, of the organization and the actual practices which derive from earlier institutional settings in this case of these international steel cartels of the interwar period and that clearly led to friction and to problems with also uh, with the identity of these new organizations Johan, do you want to add to that? Well, you know, the picture I showed is uh, because during the Cold War, the experts provided continuity. So they 
they continue to collaborate, for example, on railway standards. And uh, so there were networks in place. So when uh, uh, with the fall of the Berlin Wall and the opening up of, you know, the uh, accession of uh, Central and Eastern European countries to the EU, these all the networks shaped what happened. So there were underlying networks in place which has persisted which have persisted and they uh, so they uh, well it is negative or positive you can debate this uh, but there were networks in place, the tabula rasa and that's also in a way the main point of the book the eu was a latecomer also in the process so we often think that the european integration process started with the eu it didn't start with the eu it started in according to the hypothesis in our book uh, in the, in the 19th century and that led to a host to a whole transnational field with many actors and the eu came in late and then there were frictions of course as wolfram said between the eu and all the other actors so the eu history has a history of struggle between the nation state and the eu institutions but we write it as a struggle between a whole range of transnational and international organizations Can I can I come back once again to this friction part? Did you see is there continuity in between pre-European integration and post-European integration? So the 1945, 1950 um, historical rupture to, in the networks that you analyzed and in the expertise um, that is within the two areas that you that you analyzed. Is there a continuity of this network fabric also within European community institutions that we see, or is that a completely new start because there's now something like a political system that wants to steer. Now there's continuity, but there's also struggle. But there is in terms of continuity. And what the experts do, what I've seen in transport, they collaborate in the uh you know the coal and steel community and uh the EU institution, but they're also active on other platforms. So they 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 try to negotiate this, so they want to see where they can best act, either in the OECD, or in or in the context of the coal and steel community, or in the com. So they they, uh, but it's the same network basically of actors involved, of experts, yes, of experts. And how do the institute, um, Wolfram? Sorry. Oh, wow. How do you did, do the institutions that have been developed by the European communities come in? Do they overlap? Do they interact? How do they arrange their interactions in the areas? Well, there's a um, sustained attempt in many sectors, starting with the coal and steel community, of course, to make uh, these institutions uh, more influential and, uh, for example, Monet immediately placed a great emphasis on the representation of the high authority as an organ of the European Coal and Steel Community, as its external representative in other international organizations like the UNECE and the OECD. So the idea was that these organizations could then not anymore decide policies that wouldn't be compatible with the ECSC's internal setup and policies. So there is an attempt from the very beginning to make these new or Europe institutions or whatever you want to call them of the six founding members of these three organizations by the end of the 1950s more hegemonic in their fields but that uh, leads to very different uh, problems and challenges so very clearly there are conflicts in the case of steel because there's this toleration of export cartels and other countries and producers of steel it's like Sweden for example become extremely upset about the way that uh, the ECS is effectively tolerating or even supporting the creation of these export um, cartels. So we have conflict and then we have other areas like railways where it's an outright failure in a sense from the perspective of the core Europe organizations in the first 20, 25 years or so of the existence of the EEC treaty to become more hegemonic. And that can at least partly be explained with the technology because the, the networks, the railway networks obviously didn't end on the borders of the EEC and there were a lot of other existing players already that had a larger spatial scope, which is very important and were in that sense uh, better able, better able to deal with these problems um, than the uh, EEC. 
And so there was a technological advantage that these other organizations had, and also in terms of the existing networks, because they had been quite stable over such a long period of time, it was difficult and also not seen by EEC-based experts necessarily as desirable to exclude, say, the Danes or the Swiss or the Poles. This had a pan-European dimension, as Johannes already said, from the existing collaborations, which focusing everything on the EEC would have required this, this divisive exclusion and breakup of networks. So it took the, the EEC quite a long time then in areas like that particularly to acquire a greater hold over the policy area and the technological issues involved. Yes. So for the for the transport, the failure of the uh, EEC transport policy is due to experts who didn't allow and they obstructed this uh, because and they arranged the integration through their own organizations basically so it's not obstruction so much by the national governments it's obstruction by these other inter transnational organizations uh, which work through their own platforms because they really disliked the kind of idea this transport policy was used to build politi political unification so this whole stepping stone ideology, they really disliked. So, so when when you talk about the the interaction of the two groups, let's say, of institutional technocratic actors, um, what seems is, and we're now talking about that in hindsight, but what seems is that at the very beginning, um, that there was not much public involved, right? So can we understand that these processes were behind closed doors, very much in the institutional frames of negotiations? And how did that change? Because Johan, you, you alluded to um, a new democratic element needs to be embedded to be able to take this forward and to put um, the um, technocratic inter internationalism on a, on a new step. How did this evolve? Did the, the democratization of the European Union itself has an Im had an impact on that, the elections to the European Parliament? Or was it technology itself? So social media, uh, more scrutiny on institutional actions. How did the two interplay? Well, the, uh, first of all, you know, in reality, of course, the uh, railway packages and so on later on, we, you know, the European Parliament, so the EU demo, democratized to some extent, you've got the European Parliament, so uh, so more actors getting involved. Uh, I, I, but you can ask the question, okay, how do you build this boundary? Because for the experts, many of these experts at that time, it was not necessary to involve the public. That was their view. Uh, and to some extent, I would say there are a lot of technical uh, aspects that you may want to delegate to experts. Uh, so the question is, at what point should public consultation come in? And do you do this through participatory uh, mechanisms? Or do you do this through representative democracy? So this is a very complex institutional design uh, issue, uh, uh, but I think uh, uh, the uh, success, I mean, the, the lack of, I mean, the railway integration didn't proceed, you know, there, there's still many problems with railway integration. I think partly because it became very politicized in a way that experts wanted to prevent, in fact. Uh, so, uh, and I think there was something to say for this. So I, I'm not, again, I'm not, I, I think if you look at technocracy, it has been a major force in the 20th century. It, it uh, you know, it connected itself with fascism and communism and democracy, but we have never thought about the relationship between technocracy and democracy. And this is especially important for the EU because of its origins. Because on the national level, it's clearer. Can I just add to this perhaps that I think in terms of public and media scrutiny, maybe there's much more of that since 
the what is now the European Union acquired far more regulatory powers in the late 1980s and early 1990s. But of course, uh, as a project, in a sense, th this was highly contested within what is now the European Union from the very beginning. So uh, those who were strongly opposed to a kind of more technocratic vision where experts uh, define common rules for Europe, uh, allegedly in the interest of all Europeans in these new organizations. Um, then we have strong opposition to that. And I think that's very important to remember, not just from someone like Charles de Gaulle, the French president in the early 1960s, who talks about the European Commission as the embodiment, embodiment of this form of technocracy that in his view is not legitimized at all democratically and therefore should be marginalized or should just support the nation states in running uh, the European Economic Community as it was called at the time. But I think it's important to keep in mind that also the European Parliament, not yet directly elected, but there are strong voices in the European Parliament in the early 1960s at exactly the same time, who from a very different perspective make the same argument and say we don't actually want the European Commission to dominate politics and policy making because we do not share its as an institution within the EEC, its too technocratic vision. We want from a more federalist perspective, which is strongly opposed to this, to gain political control, if you like, through transnational democracy, which has to be built from their perspective in the European economic community, and then to to dominate or you know utilize the technocratic expertise of the Commission in far more directly legitimized democratic institutional context and processes. And so you have from very different nationalistic, if you like, and transnational democratic perspectives, criticism of the technocratic internationalist tradition and how in particular this was embodied by the European Commission apparently or really as an institution within the larger organization. Great, thanks a lot for clarifying Wolfram. Um, uh, can you, if we talk about the European Parliament for a second again, and I remind you all that the chat function is open, you can send in your questions. Um, is, do you have examples for such a counter vision of the European Parliament in the policy areas that you analyzed against this international technocracy approach? What were their proposals to embed more democratic elements into the policy process? Well, the experts didn't, didn't think about that. The experts I've studied, uh, they, 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 they were concerned that they could not do their job as they saw, you know, so they, they, uh, they disliked, I think, largely uh, what the European Parliament was trying to do. So they were not so positive about that because they, they saw it as a too political process. Uh, so, the, but there was never a good discussion about this whole. As, uh, perhaps Wolfram knows more about the the larger history of European integration, but uh, you know there was never a good discussion about this about how to do this. Mm -hmm. So they they Thanks. relied because of that they relied on their own platforms. Mm -hmm. I, I think uh, you're trying to sort of inverse the question. Of course, our perspective was for this book was not on the European Parliament and how it addressed this. So that's perhaps why we can't say so much about this. But I nevertheless think that there are a couple of examples where the European Parliament has pushed for greater scrutiny of processes that had been very much influenced by these technocratic forms of cooperation and practices that predated even the creation of the European Coal and Steel Community. And, uh, cooperation in research funding, I think, is a very good example of this. So the practice in the ECSC was effectively was effectively that the business organizations in the and mainly the steel producing businesses represented on the consultative committee informally in cooperation with the high authority decided how to carve up the funding that the ECSC provided or co-funding that it provided for research in particular areas. So they defined a desirable research and then basically carved it up and importantly according to national lines so they cooperated transnationally to give the european funding nationally to businesses and business organizations and this really only changed from the 1970s onwards with the framework programs also for coal and steel where the demand was made and this was strongly demanded by the european parliament as well to create truly transnational forms of cooperation and allocation of research funding, which would overcome this previous form of 
transnational cooperation, but to allocate funding to national projects. I think this is one example that I can come up with from the top of my head. But as Johan has said, I think there was also in the European Parliament too much discussion about this in the 1980s. I think uh, quite a lot of this sort of expertise driven politics and policy making was still recognized as essential or important. And I think the focus was far more at the general political level about the relationship between the Parliament and the member states and the Council and the role of future desirable role of the Parliament in forms of co-decision in the legislative process. So at the sort of uh, meta level, if you like, of European Union or European community politics, rather than the, the um, um, level below that of cooperation uh, in the policy making process with um, experts and expert networks. Thanks a lot, Wolfo. I have a very, very long question here. If you raise the questions, please keep them short and pronounced because this will take a lot of time to read out. So you have mentioned that till today a certain democratic deficit prevails and that addressing this would be positive for the EU to address today's challenges such as migration and climate change. On the other hand, with the COVID-19 crisis and the emergency measures taken, we see a state of exception installed and a more national approach dominating what is your perspective on what happened during the COVID crisis? Um, I, I do think this alludes to the role of experts within the crisis and about the transnational replies to the crisis. Right? You want? Do you, can you do any extrapolation from the analysis of your historical analysis to that contemporary question, or is that not possible based on what you Well, I think analyzed? if you look at COVID, the response is mainly national. So uh, what you can see is that uh, uh, we have very different ways of managing and navigating the COVID crisis. Uh, and I don't think the EU is very forceful or powerful and I, it doesn't have the instruments to really deal with this. So uh, I would say the EU should, uh, you know, what they can do is, is uh, coordinate between the various experiments, national experiments, so be a learning platform in a way. And it should be content with that role instead of trying to go further. Uh, so that is uh, my my analysis. Because if it wants to go further, you know, you, you will see it gets into trouble. If I can add to this, perhaps um, I think the the mainly national response to the crisis can be explained largely by the fact that there is a public demand for security for health security that is directed in the first place at national politics and policy making irrespective of whether the european union has a competence or whether eu law and practices are affected because they have been heavily affected by decisions by member state governments for example to close borders in a way that has been exceptionally disruptive and also illegal in part of course so um and this is where this comes from. What I find more interesting is that in this particular area, there isn't a very strong, and maybe that's to do with the way in which, which health um, is constituted also at, at the level of expertise, perhaps more global where there is cooperation and purely European, but experts have also allowed themselves to be bought up, if you like, by national politicians and governments as advisors just for their own national policy making. And I don't see in this particular case that there's some kind of trans, uh, truly transnational European level form of cooperation among experts advocating European solutions, which can be European solutions and only can, of course, be solutions that transcend the nation state, but also respects the huge differences uh, below the nation state level between the different localities or regions and how they are affected. And only now, about eight weeks or 10 weeks or so into the crisis, are people beginning to talk about the possibility, for example, a discussion in France to link in inverted commas green regions in Europe, irrespective of where they might be located in terms of the member state. This is something that has taken an awfully long time, as much um, to be explained with the fact that we're in a crisis situation. And what Johan and I have been looking at in our book is long term uh, trends and trajectories. 
Thanks a lot. Fonk, I, I have you wanting to come in, please. Just a, a, a question on the international dimension to come back to, to, to the book. In the Schumann Declaration, it was stated that a, a part of the purpose of the, the emerging community was to also provide a common good, including to the African continent. And this is part of the Schumann Declaration. Among those internationalist technocrats that you are studying is this vision of a kind of wider use or wider perspective present or they are just fixing uh, the economy uh, and the, the market of the, the center of northwestern Europe? Well, um, I can talk about Railways, of course, is a technology which is uh, not global. If you look at telegraphy, or if you were to look at uh, telephony, or so they were global. So they certainly included the colonies, and that was one of their uh, issues. In fact, with the uh, emergence of the European integration process proper that it was disruptive to some of their global visions. But the experts often had a kind of layered vision. So you built, let's say, a, a global technological zone. And within that, you interface with uh, national or regional zones. Uh, so they, they, they had a, they, so they really uh, had a difficulty with limit in the first, a limited to six countries, the whole idea that you can have a technological zone for all the infrastructures for these six countries, they saw as rubbish and as purely political project, political, what they called political, uh, while they, they included the colonies for sure. Also say perhaps if I can add to this that it was mainly not not exclusively but mainly of course a French debate about the creation of the Rafi, and that it was mainly driven by political concerns about um, well, liberation movements or whatever you want to call them uh, that were looking forward to establishing the independence of French colonial territories or overseas territories as well they were called became called in the EEC's language. Um, and that this at the administrative or technocratic level was largely driven by people within the French colonial administration. So there, and that was not very heavily connected I think, to other colonial administrations. And that later, of course, this lack of connection also led to clashes within the European economic community, especially after its enlargement to include the United Kingdom as the second other large former, then by then former colonial power, power. But what we see, of course, is once the EEC is set up and it has got an investment fund and later this is turned into the Aoundé and the Lomé conventions and so on, is that there are nevertheless connections between these particular imperial traditions uh, or colonial traditions, if you like, and the way in which these new organizations operate. So the DG, which is responsible for development aid policy in the 1960s, very heavily dominated by former French colonial administrators. So there are, of course, such connections between the national and the European level in terms of the practices as they develop after the organizations are set up. Great. Thanks a lot. Apologies for my distraction. I'm receiving um, uh, Q&A still in, in, in the chat. We are unfortunately already at the end of our book talk. And this is really interesting because um, there's actually a, a lot to say also on the meta level about how your book not disrupted but shook potentially the discipline itself. Maybe we can exploit the extra two minutes and I'm... I'm um, uh, extending a bit. I'm sorry for that, but uh, do you have a quick answer on how the the discipline, so histor historical analysis, received your book? Do you start? Or I start. Well, I think maybe I should start. Uh, uh, that's maybe something where we can't necessarily claim a victory or only victories. 
because I, we've also found that it's a bit of a struggle with a long-term perspective and an attempt to also connect this to present-day politics and policy making to some extent at least is difficult really because we are trying to do so much to, to connect in such a way to more clearly delineated disciplinary areas or within history subdisciplines or subfields uh, to have a huge impact on the way in which particular processes are perceived or written about. So in the narrow field, which I can briefly talk about, of European integration history, I think we are still unfortunately in a situation where the majority of colleagues who work on European integration take a perspective where they focus exclusively on the prehistory of what is now the European Union. Even if you don't go back to the 19th century, even if you don't therefore extend uh, the, your perspective in this way in a temporal manner, at least I think it would be necessary, and that's also something we are trying to do in our book, to look at the, this cooperation and competition with other institutional uh, uh, setups. And that could be, for example, the European Free Trade Association in the 1960s, that is not so technical, but more about trade. So this is something that where I think we have a lot of work to do in terms of convincing subfields uh, within the, even just the discipline of history to take both the temporal aspect much more seriously and also to look at this question of cooperation and competition between different institutional settings and working practice. Yeah, I think, you know, our book, uh, European Integration History, is from inside out. So it looks at the, you know, it looks from inside out and we look from outside in. And uh, the other issue is that we focus on technology. And as I said, technology is often not integrated in any history because historians consider it as something that comes out of the heaven and done by engineers. Uh, and, they, and they don't realize that history is made through building technical connections. And uh, so we have disconnects with history in a broader sense and a European integration history, and also to some extent history of technology as a discipline, uh, because we extend what history of technology means. Mm -hmm. uh, because we go into much larger processes than they normally focus on. So that makes the reception of this book more difficult, I guess, because we do not fit in a disciplinary uh mold or how do you call it uh, you know so uh, it is strong maybe yeah. maybe Gabi, i can make one final point which is that we would yeah. of course love a book like this to be read by people who are involved in contemporary politics and policy making in the european you know or in a broader framework but that is from a historical perspective is really hard to achieve because our impression is and i don't know when this started that nowadays policy makers really have very, very little time to read more than a one to two page summary of something. When you as a historian look back on the say the 1950s or 60s, when you read diaries, for example, of mm. prime ministers, you find that they continuously, they're continuously reading not just historical books, but also novels and others to enhance, I mean, sometimes obviously just for fun to spend their free time, but sometimes also to enhance their reflexive knowledge. And I think this ability and maybe the time for this uh, ability to enhance your reflexive knowledge about things that don't help immediately with sorting out a particular policy concern in the year 2020 is no longer there and i think this is something that we also find a little dis a bit disappointing or perhaps creating problems for contemporary politics and policy making that is actually the perfect wrap that I wanted to give to the book, because that's why I started with all the new technologies that we are dealing with, and we barely know how they impact the system, how they impact the system. And from my point of view, having a look into such a good book on a whole sector, comparing two different sectors to understand how technology has inspired, thickened, strengthened technocracy and influenced the policy area is such an important thing to do for um, academics and also for policymakers. So that's why I wanted to thank you particularly for the book, um, because I do think looking into it inspires our way to think systemically about the new challenges that we do have with technological transformation and democratization ahead of us. And in uh, that sense, I want to thank you very much for presenting the book today, also for being part on our technological transformation in EPRS, as you were the pilots and the pioneers of the uh, of the online book um, chance. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that the Q&A could not really happen. I'm 
so um, we will we will figure this out. I'm getting in the messages. Sorry to, for that. Um, thank you very much um, for all of you. I can only recommend that it's a really good read. And uh, stay tuned for the next book talk that we will announce also online. And uh, thank you very much to the two authors for joining us today. Thanks for fun. Thanks, Yuan. Thank you. Thank you to you, Gabby, to have animated that. Uh, it was great. Great pleasure. Great pleasure. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Stay safe.